ages, very, very important publications. The first one came out in 1905, and the second one in 1907. And of course, I would put in front in terms of the philosophical direction of education, the role that Garvey played. And he himself was, was shaped um, by Robert Love through the, the, the advocate newspaper that Love founded in uh, the last decade of the 19th century. In fact, Garvey actually said that if, if, if Dr. Love was, was here, um, Former Governor General Sir Kenny Hall, Chairman of the Law and Money Foundation, Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed scholars, good evening. Good evening. I am Tamara Dickens, and I stand here to usher you through today's proceedings. It is with great honor that I welcome you to this profound gathering at regardless the Manly Center, a place steeped in the rich legacy of our nation's history. As we convene this evening, we embark on a journey of enlightenment and introspection, delving into the intricate layers of our collective past and its profound implications on our present and our future. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's event promises to be an intellectual feast featuring thought-provoking discourse and the historical facts. But before we delve into the heart of our program, let us all rise to the theme of our national anthem.
so missions be the rhythmic, the rhythmic be certainly served as a fitting prelude to the enlightening discourse that we are about to have. Thank you so very much, Mr. Mitchell. You're welcome. Certainly was a mesmerizing performance. Just want you to know that your talent knows no bounds, and we thank you for your contribution. Now, without any more delay, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for this evening, Dr. Clinton A. Cotton. Professor Clinton Button is the director of the Institute of Technological and Educational Research and Michael University College and a distinguished scholar at the P.J. Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He is a, he is a retired professor of Caribbean political philosophy, culture, and aesthetics at the University of the West Indies, where he has been lecturing for more than 30 years. Professor Hutton, is an award-winning researcher and author with a distinguished record of research and publications on the Morant Bay Uprising, the Haitian Revolution, the cultural and the philosophy of enslaved Africans, Caribbean political philosophy, African Caribbean spirituality, cultural, art, music, and aesthetics, and the issues regarding Caribbean civilization, such as freedom, sovereignty, and agency. Professor Hutton's numerous publications include The Logic and Historical Significance of the Haitian Revolution and The Cosmological Roots of Haitian Freedom, Color for Color, Skin for Skin, Marching with the Ancestral Spirits into War, O and At Morant Bay. Leonard Percival Howell and the Genesis of Rastafari, of which he is lead editor and author. The creative ethos of the African dance hall, performance, aesthetics, and the fight for freedom and identity in Caribbean Quarterly. The Asian Revolution and the articulation of a modernist epistemology in critical arts. Bob Marley, revolutionary prophet of African unity in the Pan-African Pantheon, prophets, poets, and philosophers, edited by Adeke Adebajo, and the revival table, feasting with the ancestors and spirits in the Jamaica Journal. Professor Horton has no doubt made more than 100 conference presentations and has initiated and organized many conferences, symposia, seminars, and research projects. He is often invited to give distinguished lectures and other lectures and speeches at educational institutions, cultural, artistic, religious, spiritual, professional, and community organizations and associations in Jamaica, and the Caribbean at large. Pro Professor Houghton is the holder of the Order of Distinction, Commander Class, for his contribution to culture and education. He has received the Michael Millennium Gold Medal Award, as well as the Mosul Gold Medal Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Houghton brings unparalleled expertise and insight into the historic halls of Agarhas this evening. His lecture on the impact of pre- and post-slavery colonial education on the mental development of African people promised it to be both enlightening and thought-provoking. Following Professor Holland's lecture, we will have a question and answer segment, providing you with the opportunity to engage with our speaker directly. So, I encourage you to ponder your questions carefully as Professor Hunt imparts his knowledge with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, make you welcome. Ah, 
Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm going to do a presentation in this space on um, education during slavery, after slavery, and um, how it shaped our present educational trust philosophy, if you will, and probably something on what is it? The things that were left out of educational system, philosophically, and so on. Right? So, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So. Um, so let us begin. When I say from this space, this space because we know of Norman Manley's role in the development of education um, in the 1950s, um, we had a problem with secondary education. We had an important role to expand the cohorts of persons who could go to high schools. Uh, Taking over from before that, from um, uh, Edwin Allen, who has got little, very little um, praise for what he has done, but he opened the space for high school education for more ordinary Jamaican people and, and, and continued under um, Norman Manley, who had that instinct for a long while. And, uh, and in the 1970s, which Hedwin Ali actually supported, the thrust made um, in, in expanding even further um, secondary education to the black population, essentially, who were shut out of secondary education. And uh, Professor Miller has written um, an essay on the role that Hedwin Ali played in, in this thrust to develop um, and expand secondary education. But the ordinary teachers and those who have built schools, many of them who went to Michael, um, is just, there's nothing else to compare it with, you know? And we have those outstanding persons from all walks of life, um, from the 19th century into the 20th century. And the good thing about them is that they did not allow colonial education to have its day without any resistance to it. And, and including also people outside of tre teacher training colleges and, and, and primary and secondary schools, you have the informal system um, of education, um, both from the, the folk as well as from those who have been schooled, like Theolophius um, Strauss, um, who was a medical doctor, um, and went to Africa, um, but has written his opus, two volumes called Glimpses of the Ages, very, very important publications. The first one came out in 1905 and the second one in 1907. And of course, I would put in front in terms of the philosophical direction of education, the role that Garvey played, and he himself was shaped um, by Robert Love through the, the, the advocate newspaper that Love founded in uh, the last decade of the 19th century. In fact, Garvey actually said that if, if, if Dr. Love was, was here, um, it would not be him, Marcus, they would be stoning, it would be Love. And so, so so the education system that we have inherited from Britain informally and formally, that system was to promote British interests. That system was to promote uh, a subordination in the feelings and belief system of the people who were colonized and so on. So, um, but we're going to see 
what was left out of this education thing and what um, still left out to a large extent and um, but how we need to really deal with these things. Um, because there was a fear, I mean, in, in 1962, you know, one of the first things that happened was the, the abolition of Emancipation Day. <laughs> that happened in 1962. And it was, what, 1987, under, under P.J. Patterson that that was re, re, reinstituted. Emancipation Day was the, the premier celebration of the people of African descent in this country. And even when it was not, uh, when it was ignored and proscribed, people continued to celebrate that um, up into 1987 and still do today. So before independence in 1962, Jamaica had experienced 468 years of colonial subjection. Over 330 of those years covered slavery. Uh, the Tainos were the first to be enslaved and within 30 years totally decimated. It doesn't mean that there are people, not people in Jamaica who are Tino or what kind of blood, like myself. Um, but what happened to the Tainos in Jamaica was genocide in its classical sense. And, and, and genocide happened with the black population because over one million Africans were brought to Jamaica throughout the period of slavery. Over a million. And when slavery ended officially in, nine, in real life in, 1930, in 1838, the black population of Jamaica was just 330,000. genocide. The black population was unable to, to reproduce itself. So it was on the road to extinction. Right? So what was the education that was given them? So, Slavery did have uh, a system of education. Um, in fact, this system of education had two component parts. The formal, literate, um, meaning reading, writing, book, colleges, universities, etc., etc. And I'll, I'll, I'll take from that. But the, the informal part, and the informal part, I must say, um, was probably more, more impactful on the, the population because here we have rituals of subordination, rituals in which people of African descent were socialized to believe what the enslavers said of them. In other words, not to think as if they are subordinate people, but to think in the way that the European thought of them. So their thinking was no longer their thinking, but the same thinking and attitude towards themselves that the European um, had of them. And, and that, uh, to this day, I mean, there are some people who are still saying anything to black. That's part of the education, the legacy of that education. Right? So, not a few. Eh? Not a few. No, not at all, not at all. Strong legacy. So, the point is though, that all social, political, and economic system anywhere in the world has its means of justification, of defense, of maintenance. British enslavement in Jamaica and the other parts of the Caribbean, including French and, and the Dutch and the Spanish, they also developed ideas. Um, 
to educate people into the state in which they want to push them. People were educated as superiors, people were educated as inferiors. Right? And um, we'll, we'll look at um, some, of, some of these. So, So the complex, education complex, a pedagogical complex which the, which the European developed in, in the Caribbean um, in respect to themselves and in respect to, to the enslaved population. Um, let me give you one example of a statement made by a governor of Martinique in the 18th century, which captures what they were really about. The safety, this is, I'm quoting him, the safety of whites demands that we keep the Negroes in the most profound ignorance. I have reached the stage of believing firmly that one must treat Negroes as one treats beasts. Huh? So, this is education, this is pedagogy. Right? This is what the system was not just calling for, but was implemented. And therefore, how do you treat one as a beast? Right? And how do you command ignorance? No, ignorance in this context is not a lack of education. Ignorance is a way of educating. The safety of whites demands that we keep the Negroes in the most profound ignorance. And then, and then uh, apart from that, that they must be treated as beasts. And that is for the safety of the system of enslavement in Jamaica. So, so philosophically, there are two main features here, or categories here. One, in relation to ignorance, is what we would call uh, the philosophy of knowledge, or epistemology. How do you train people educationally to behave a certain way? And the other is, is, is in the, um, the philosophy of being, the philosophy of existence. And the philosophy that this government is governance talking about is it's, it refers to it as beasts. How therefore do you shape the black population to be beasts and for them to, be, to behave like beasts? And I'm suggesting to you that these two categories were inseparable. They were inseparable. And people like Frederick Douglass spoke about these things eloquently. Um, so, so we are saying that ignorance is not the lack of education, but the endowment of a consciously constituted form of education and of educating. Right? And to devise this form of education, Africans must be kept in profound ignorance. That is a stable state of knowledge framed by the slaveholders and they must be treated as beasts and what, what do we mean by that? There was a policy of forcing Africans in Jamaica and places like Haiti to eat human excrement. We have evidence for that. In Westmoreland, in Jamaica, in Kingston, in Haiti, people were forced to eat human excrement as punishment. And more often than not, the people who, were, who would be required to defecate in the mouth of, of the person being punished is one of his colleagues. Right? And, and in that, you can begin to see one element 
of the sowing of division amongst people of African descent. That is not my talk today, but we can look at the way in which Africans were socialized to be disloyal to each other and to be loyal to the enslavers. Right? So, a, a, a shuttle, and this is important because a shuttle slavery is a different breed of slavery. Slavery existed all over the world, especially in ancient times. In the modern period of this world, chattel slavery, or Atlantic chattel slavery, was a special breed of enslavement. And we have to understand, uh, to understand that. Now let us continue. So, a shuttle, a negro slave, and I'm quoting here, a negro slave is as much property as any other thing. And how do you make property out of people? First of all, property has no rights. But owners of property have rights. Right? Africans were deemed to be property. Working generation after generation without pay, without being able to pass on to their children and their children's children the fruit of their labor. The result of that is a Europe that was far ahead of the rest of the world. And, and, and many of those companies are still around today. Um, Bar Barclays Bank, for example, um, was founded by slave traders. Two slave traders founded Barclays Bank. Barclays Bank is still in operation today. Right? But we won't go further into that. So, the view, therefore, was that Africans were animal-like. And one feature of this them being animal-like in the system of education is that they are intellectually inferior to Europeans. And the literature on this is wide and deep and rich, if you will, in, term, in terms of that justification. So, so we would have a person like the Immanuel Kant, the classical German philosopher, who made a statement in which he said, this fellow was quite black from head to foot, a clear proof that what he said was stupid. So you don't have to hear the person say anything at all to analyze what he's saying. All you have to know is his color, and you can determine whether he's stupid or not stupid. Right? So that this assumed inherent stupidity, stupidity represented by black skin was just part of a beastly or animal, animalized ontological or identity complex denoting the African as unintellectual, irrational, uncultured, unaesthetic, criminal, unsophisticated, with extremely weak moral sentiments dominated by an arbitrary sensuous will. And, and to this day, <laughs> so, so African struggle for freedom was viewed as a struggle to return to their, their zoological state. That's, a, that's one of the terms used by George Hegel. Right? So if you if the, the struggle for freedom launched by people like Taki and the Maroons to a good extent and um, Samshar and so on, they, these were represented as struggle to return to barbarism. They were not freedom struggles. They were struggles 
to support the appetites of black men for sex. That was what the fight was for. And, and, and in, in, this, in this state, the fight was to enslave white women and turn them into sex slaves of black men. So all the fight for freedom was a fight to, sex, to, to, to satisfy their sexual appetite. It was not a fight to be free. It was not a fight about justice. It was a fight for sexual gratification. And the literature on this is wide. Right? Talking about 18th century literature, 19th century literature, and 17th century literature. Right? It's, it, it, it's wide. But also, part of, of wanting to go back to their natural state was that Africans were inherently lazy, especially the men. And they were fighting to, to be free to go back to that laziness. Right? And in, 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 the, in the space of this laziness, black women were enslaved by them. Right? And therefore, what is being positive was that, that part of enslavement was to free black women from black men. That was part of why they were enslaved. Of course, another part of why they were enslaved was, was, was that they were lazy. And, and therefore, the purpose of their enslavement was to take them out of that type of situation. Right? So they were lazy and therefore they must be forced, um, must be forced to, to work. Okay. So let us look at another example. David Hume, Hume was a, a Scottish philosopher, an economist, um, a man educated, he had his PhD, he was a university professor, um, and he, he, uh, he, he um, this is what he had to say about the, the mental and intellectual state of of non-Europeans generally, but specifically of Africans. He says, I am apt to suspect the Negroes, and in general, all other species of men, for there are four or five different kinds, to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white nor even an individual eminent either in action or speculation. No ingenious manufacturers amongst them. No arts, no science. Such a uniform and constant difference could not happen in so many countries and ages if nature had not made an original distinction between these breeds of men. Not to mention our colonies. There are Negro slaves dispersed all over Europe of whom none ever discovered any symptoms of ingenuity. Though low people without education will start up amongst us and distinguish themselves in every profession in Jamaica. Indeed, they talk of one Negro as a man of parts and learning. But it is likely he is admired for slender accomplishments. Like a parrot who speaks a few words plainly. Now this man that that Hume was talking about 
was one Francis Williams. Francis Williams was born in Jamaica to Africans who were free. Mother and father were free blacks. And Montagu wanted to work on experiment by sending him for classical education in Britain. And they said, to prove that, that's what <laughs> right, so, so he was sent to Britain for classical schooling, which would include Latin and all of those things. We, we're talking about the, the 18th century, right? And um, he passed. When he finished that, he was sent to do mathematics as at Cambridge University. He passed. He did well. Uh, this is a man that Humes is talking about, who can only speak a few words like Arras, right? So, but he came back hoping to be employed by the, the colonial state administration and wasn't employed. But he was allowed, which is which is strange, but he is the exception that proved the rule. He was allowed to establish a school in Spanish. Right? And it was also a point. Right? So this is a man. So, so what we are seeing here is that psychologically, the African was incapable of being human because he's intellectually inferior. Tied to that. And there are calculations, you know, because what they went on to do was to begin to measure the brains of different people, different races of people, and to come up with the, the, the conclusion that the brains of black people were smaller than white people. And that is the reason for their intellectual their diminishing, or their diminished intellectual force. But attached to that small brain is a large genitalia. That the reason why they have small brain is because they have large genitalia. So they think with their genitalia. There's a song by Admiral Bailey. You know that song? Huh? Give me you don't know that song? Give it one. Give it one. Oh. That's what they're good for. Right? Yes. So, so, and, and that is also proof that they were animalistic. That is one proof of being animalistic. And that is proof of shutting them out of education. Because they are incapable of doing it. But in my time going to university, even though some people are saying that, not on that basis, but it follows somewhat that the boy go to university and study till he turn fool. <laughs> right? We hear that quite often. Not from this generation, no. The generation when I was a boy growing up and little after that. That you, you go to university, especially if you go to university, the boy come home and start wearing town. <laughs> And wear sandals, study till it turn full. Right? Having said that though, there has always been a strong current in Jamaica amongst black people to educate their children and for the education of their children. And um, so let us let us move away from that. I, I mean not detain you any further in relation, although there are many other things. But, but um, to go to education after slavery was abolished. And the, the, the act was passed in 1834. The process of it was 1832. Passed 1834. Uh, also passed was the, the, the Negro Education Grant, um, which formally established in the 1830s. Um, primary schooling across Jamaica, and some level of basic schools, schooling as well, right? And so, 
it's important to, to locate the role of the church in this process. And I've done a lot of work on that. But safe to say that one, the church before slave was abolished was endeavoring to teach Christianity to the black population. The Anglican church first, then the Methodists. Right? Um, no, the Baptists, in fact, if you speak about um, Lyle and those people, the American Baptists coming out, black Baptists who supported the British in the, in the American War of Independence, there were four of them who were allowed to preach. Uh, Lyle was arrested shortly after and charged for treason. Right? The I said Methodist? Moravian. It could be the Marine. Okay, right? So 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 we have but the Anglicans, which was the biggest church even after even after state church. It, it was the biggest church. church. It wasn't the state church, right? It was. But what they were doing prior to independence, not independence, emancipation made them the biggest church in terms of people attending, the black population attending. Of course, after that, that, that was taken over because other churches proved more beneficial in the eyes of the black population. But the, but the point I want to make is that when this, this Negro, um, Negro education grant was established, the state, the post-emancipation colonial state turn over education to the church. Right? They turn over education to the church for a number of reasons. The first being that the church was the first, first to, to start education amongst the people. Right? They were the first to start it and were, most of the planters were against it. They passed laws in, in 1808, thereabouts, um, for imprisonment of people who were caught without permission teaching. Because the, the preaching of these ministers to the enslaved population was simultaneously teaching them to read and write. And Preaching of Christianity in Jamaica was simultaneously teaching people to learn to read and write. The logic being that they need to know the scripture. And, and of course, immorals as well. And therefore, they need to learn how to read and write, which was the, the authorities were dead set against. Right? But enslaved Africans remember this. And uh, and when, when emancipation was almost there, in 1832, the uprising led by Sam Sharp against the caution of William Lim, another Baptist, he ignored them. Because the, the charge of the church was, in God's time, you will be free. And they are saying, we want the freedom now. Right? But in rising up against the colonial state in Jamaica, in Western Jamaica, in 1831 and 1832, the church union, which is more akin to the part of the, 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 um, the state church and other preachers within that political frame of mind, arrested Nib and Birchell and amongst others like those even though they were not part of it, accusing them of, of that their teaching and preaching was what incited the black population to revolt. And in fact, they, they, um, they burned down a number of churches um, in St. James, in Trelawney, in Hanukkah. Uh, the, uh, I think St. Elizabeth as well, they burned down a number of churches. And in St. Anne as well. <laughs> The other church union, the church union, the, the pro-colonial pro um, slave church, right? They form a union and they, um, they started to, pretty much like the clan, and started to burn down churches, 
Baptist and other church, Methodist and other churches like that. Huh? But so so the church was given the right to deal with public school in Jamaica because that was part of what they were doing, even under serious repression. But the church was valued for another thing. The church was valued because of some of the things that they were preaching. Some of the things that they were preaching was about forgiveness, loyalty, <laughs> obedience. <laughs> so, so let, in 1838, this is, uh, let me see, the 28th of January, 1838, the West Indian newspaper um, published a part of what they were about. And it says in part, the honor, this is preaching to enslaved and, new, and now newly freed Africans. Uh, in fact, still, still going on. The honor of a servant is his fidelity. His highest virtues are submission and obedience. Be patient, therefore, under the reproofs of the master. And when he rebuked thee, answer not again. The silence of thy resignation shall not be forgotten. Be studious of his interest. Be diligent in his affairs and faithful to the trust which he reposeth in thee. Thy time and thy labor belong to him. Defraud him not thereof. And so, so we see one of the reasons why the church was important um, in the estimation of the, the colonial states headed by, the, at that time, was uh, Governor Lionel Smith. Right? In fact, Lionel Smith um, gave an emancipation presentation, Spanish Town. In fact, there's a print. You know that print of Spanish Town about emancipation? There's a, there's a well-known print. It's, if you Google, you might get it, right? Um, he, one of the things that he said to, to the enslaved, um, well, formerly are to be freed uh, people, uh, one of the things that he, 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 he said to them is that they need to follow the church leaders, right? What, what he calls the religious ministers. They will keep you out of trouble, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so that is one reason again. And safe to say, therefore, that the church, um, in these instances, the role that they were playing was one, that of preaching obedience, etc., etc., and two, was to, to marginalize the black population from its ancestral culture. That was very, very strong. Those two things, right? But let us, let us move on. So, the church took over the education process for formal schooling. In 1836, Michael College was established. And with three students, non-Jamaican, to be trained as teachers, and then it continued, well, Michael still exists today. Um, and it was the biggest training institution. There were more, there were others that came after Michael, several, including um, towards the end of the 19th century, Shortwood and Bethlehem and so on, right? So, um, what I want to say though about the importance of teaching reading and writing, as something new. It is not that all black people came to, to the Caribbean not knowing how to read and write, but not in European text. There were blacks in Jamaica who read and write in Arabic texts as one example. Right? But the, the thing of what is important about teaching 
uh, which is one of the positive legacy, therefore, the, was teaching was that the, the people would be taught ABC, right, in terms of Jamaica. But in learning to read and write, nobody could determine what they read, what they would have read. You are able to read and write, you can read all the newspapers, you want to read. If you can get your hands on newspapers. You can get, read all the books you want to read, if you can get your hands on them. And importantly in all of this, is that you have the capacity to interpret what you read, including interpreting the Bible. We have to understand that. And therefore, if you, if you look at certain um, religious societies that came about after that, they have their different interpretation amongst the revivalists, for example. Uh, and later on, passing on that to the Rastafarian movement. And, and Ethiopianism, which is an important component of the Bible, which, which reaches apex under Marcus Garvey, became very important in terms of the struggle for freedom and identity. Right? Now, when the Morant Bay Rebellion came in, in 1865, the people in education and in the state, uh, state, um, um, state civil servants and others like that, leading people, um, functionaries in relation to the education, a number of them made statement that the reason why the Morant Bay uprising took place was because the education that the masses was getting was flawed. It was flawed because if, if you got that education, you are not supposed to rebel against the state. You are not supposed to rebel against the plantocracy. Right? And therefore, they, they look again at the education thing and how can we tweak it so that a moral day never take place in, uh, in the history of the, the, the island again. Need to say as well, that in 1865, one of the slogans, there are several slogans, color for color, skin for skin, that's calling for unity. Another slogan, black skin, white heart. Black skin, white heart. There are people in support of Paul Bogle who argued that the type, one of the consequences of the, 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 the education system, the informal one during slavery, and the, the formal one and informal one after slavery, one of the things that was wrong about it, that it made people white on the inside. White psychologically, white mentally, European mentally, European psychologically, while they still have black skin. When I was a boy, they called it rose bread food. <laughs> As most young people in Jamaica take the American version of Oreo, you know, right? Well, no, roast bread fruit. But roast bread fruit is, is what described that type of human being. Right? It is describing a type of existence which was brought about by the way in which the black population was educated. It had black people thinking about themselves and their relation to each other and those who kept them down in the mindset, in the belief system of those who control the country. No, that is it's very important because when The, the, the amount of examples. There are many examples of this in the literature as well, you know. Uh, we can't go into to, to that. 
But um, what we can say or what we can do is to use um, two examples of this black skin, white art type of mentality. In, in 1894, a book was published called uh, A Study in Color. A Study in Color was written by a British woman by the name of Alice Spinner. And in the, the book was written based on her journey to Jamaica, interviewing on her Jamaican folk. And this is one, one character in the book. She interviewed in this novel, um, this woman, Justina, told her about the type of child she would like to give birth to. And she captures it um, as much as she can in the Jamaican language. Justina said, I never could love a little black child, same as the white. I worship the little master, and if I lucky, even I may have a fair child one day. Not of course a real white, white one that asks him too much, but still one that is almost white. And then I worship it and work for it to true. Dress it up nicely too in clean white clothes with shoes and all, just like a back baby. I hope I never have a back or dark child to shame me. That's 1894. Guess what? Marcus Garvey was just going to school in St. Anthony's Day. And he would have been seven years old at the time when this book was published. And, and I'm, I, I, I say Marcus Garvey because in Marcus Garvey's philosophy and opinions, one of its critical arguments is against the issue of black skin white art. That black people cannot be free if they are still mentally enslaved. Right? So he coined the term mental slavery. Right? But that tradition existed, as you can see before Garvey, because in Paul Gogol's time they talk about black skin white art. And therefore, how do you liberate yourself from, from being black skin and white art? How do, you, how do you bring back the, in, the interiority to, 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 um, to support the exterior? The exterior should have an internal character. That is the, the people's own will to, to survive, to, to, um, to be free, to call for justice, and so on. Sad to say that this important philosophical principle is not part of the Jamaican education system today. It was never a part of it. And what the point I'm making is that here is one of the things based on the experience and the resistance of the people in a philosophical manner in the area of pedagogy in which they are pointing to something that should be in the system of education. Informally, it is there. Informally, it is there. But formally, it's not in the, the text that they were reading. In fact, in the text that they were reading, the, I, the, the issue was that the people were, were, were in, inferior to whites intellectually and in capacity of learning, etc., etc. And that they came from an unhistorical place, which is a zoological garden, talking about Africa. And I've heard people, just a bit older than me, who have said that while they were in school, they were told by their teachers that Africa, that, but that you know, you have no history, boy, you have no history, and, and so on. So, so, so the, the problem is still there. Because this principle, even though Marcus Gahab is a national hero, and this principle spread in one Mali song, Redemption Song, which he used 
a line from Garvey's speech in 1937 to promote this issue of um, and of course there are, there are other songs Peter Tosh talked about you can't blame the youth that's another such song you know, and these people are, are, uh, came after independence in other words they were critiquing education in Jamaica post independence right? you can't blame the youth is one uh, Marley's has several songs, including one called Music Lesson. If you listen to those songs, you might be familiar with, with, with um, Sparrow. Dan is the man in the van. And when that came out, I was about seven or so years old. Dan is the man in the van. He used to come and read RJR, a, 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 a program called Calypso Kana. Right? I used to, I used, I never miss it. Right? But Dan is the man in the van is one such. And if you go across the Caribbean into, and into Central America, you will hear songs that are similar. They are critiquing a major problem, a major philosophical and pedagogical problem in the formal school system. Eh? Okay, but so, so I read to you Justina. Justina was unschooled. But I'm going to bring to you another example, and that example is from the school. Now, Telafius shows trained as a doctor in Scotland. I think he's from St. Anne in Scotland and, um, and, and Belgium. Wrote in the first volume of his two books, Glimpses of the Ages, about a, a kind of black person that he, he labeled Europeanized Ethiopian. Of this group, Scholl stated, such is the unenviable and despicable position of the average Europeanized Ethiopian. In the colleges, he may have absorbed as much Latin, Greek, and Hebrew as could they take on concrete form would suffice as cargo, the largest transatlantic liner. Yet, before a human being with pale face in abject servility, he will couch and call having from the dawn of consciousness upwards be taught to associate with the white skin anything possessing superior merit he ends up with the conviction that he himself is a mass of demerit and inferiority and so upbraiding is makeup for the curse of a black skin instead of the blessing of a white skin for the curse of curly hair instead of the blessing of straight hair. For the curse of black eyes instead of the blessing of blue eyes. He journeys through life armed, ashamed of himself and of every other member of his race. So, so what the, the point that is being made here is that no, you can be black skin white art even when you have many college degrees mm. and it, is, it depends on your philosophy of education and the role you see people play in it all right so so these are a number of the ways in which in the informal system and in the formal system we have a, a, an educational system. We won't go into the, well, we don't have time to go into how these were changed along the way by subsequent generations of Jamaica coming up into independence and still continue after independence to have a type of, of education in which, which is not just about reading and writing, but it's about the reordering of our interiority our sense of self 
right? It is on that basis that you develop confidence, that you develop the ability to work with each other. That is badly um, still still needed in, in, in this um, in this country. Including, and this is final, including one of the things that were absent in the teaching of education in Jamaica is that the full cultural tradition was left out of the curriculum. The full cultural tradition, which is exceedingly rich, which has its own pedagogy, which has, has its own interpretative, uh, interpretive complex, and which form the basis of, the, of Jamaican music, which took the world by storm and changed the world in many respects. Uh, that, that uh, the, 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 our history of, of um, what we call telling, the mother draft you up and say, you must take telling, you not take telling. What we call Proverbs, rich, philosophically, for all occasions and all seasons. I'll just say that, I'll just end here uh, this evening. Thank you very much. about your thoughts into present day education and certainly how that has impacted us as well. But as you know, it's now time for question and answer because we have Professor Horton here and why not certainly see or hear from him some more on these very pressing and important issues. So if anyone has any questions, the floor is open. sit in your house and do research and all sorts of materials. So, so, so in that context, 
it is good. Gina digitized this thing. I'm looking on things about my book, going back from the, the 1840s. All right? So, so, so that is very, very good. Well, we know that students use the thing to, to cut and paste, and when you write an essay, it's like five different persons' voices are in the essay. And they don't, don't know that you immediately know that this is just cutting and pasting. <laughs> right? And uh, which, is, which is zero, really. They're not going to pass me with that. Right? So, 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 yes. And there are a lot of cultural stuff. So, if you, if one time they could not get to see, say, revival rituals, or rituals, say, uh, Candomblé from Brazil, or Comfort from Guyana, or all of these traditions, chances are you find them on the internet. And that is, yeah, on YouTube. So, so it's very important that they can use it to, to do their essays and avoid the pitfalls, which is to, to steal, right? <laughs> and plagiarize it, right? Yes. Good afternoon, Peter. Is my dear. <clears throat> the difficulty with the education system. You're probably going to say all of them both to what I'm going to say. But one thing you mentioned was access. That you started by speaking about secondary, that access was denied. But then you said primary, and you said that the Negro Education Grant. Uh, but first of all, there was no Ministry of Education then. No. This, it was as if it, you said the government gave education to the church, but in fact, the, the government didn't have any education system. The church, it was the church that did it. Yes. And when the Negro Education Grant came along, it was the churches that got it, but then of course it stopped. Mm -hmm. And the schools had to close. But so the first issue was access. Who could go to a school? And um, I was expecting you to say more about that uh, because you say of course it's denying to 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 black people. So that's one issue is access. The second issue is the content. And you suggest that content made the students feel inferior. And I'm saying to myself, um, let's take mathematics, for example. You said that Brother Williams studied math at Cambridge and did well. Um, I don't know if there's a, a white mathematics or a black mathematics, but if we were to have uh, change the type of education system we have in Jamaica, you will still be teaching the same mathematics, I'm sure. I mean, come from Arabic in any case. So it, it's not very really European. So the issue, the issue is what? That it, it's not mathematics that's the problem. The problem would probably be history. The type of history that they learn in school. When you're learning English, the books that you learn to you be taught to read would be the problem, the content. You did mention language, but of course, language is another way that people are denied education because the language of instruction is not the language that they speak at home. Um, so, I was also expecting to hear and read about the way forward. So, so we're going to keep teaching the same mathematics. I would hope we're going to keep teaching the same science, chemistry, for example, if you saw it that I taught for years in high school. Um, but maybe we'll have to teach a different history. Maybe we'll teach a different geography. Literature. The literature that we would do to teach English would be different. Um, I was hoping you would comment a little bit more about, about how we would go forward. I have a little interest with certain schools from my particular denomination. 
And I mean, I would love to hear how we could improve. I mean, our schools are rated top, you know. But we got one or seven. But, but how do we go, how do we um, break out of the negativity right. that you speak of? So graphical. Yes, so graphical. Um, what advice would you give yes. to people who have schools that don't want to fall into the mental slavery yes. trap that you have spoken about? How, how could we go forward? I mean, well, Thank you very much for that question. And, and before you answer, Professor, because I actually was going to pose a question to you too, and I recognize that your presentation was really truncated because we didn't have enough time. But following on his question, because we touched on post-slavery after emancipation, which is in the 1800s. We really haven't gotten to the 1900s. But if you could give just a quick synopsis as to your view as to how that the, the philosophies, two philosophies that you speak of, how it is it was continued to be perpetrated in the 1800s, in the 1900s, and if you think it is still being perpetrated even now, and to follow up on this question, how do you think it will be improved or can be improved in your estimation? Yes, um, you have said a mouthful, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I know you as an educator. But, and you mentioned mathematics. <laughs> and there are the branches where well, you mentioned chemistry. Uh, but, you know, I have dealt with thousands of students. And in certain things, the student automatically believes, especially with, with certain things that we do regularly, certain inventions, they automatically think oh, right. that they were invented purely by a white people, purely by Europeans. The edu it's an education system that made them think that way. So much, some of the most useful inventions that are used daily all over the world, in medicine, right? in digital technology, right? they were done by people of African descent, they were done by people from the Asian continent, and so on. Right? So, so I'm saying this to say that the thing is history, but it's also the history of mathematics. You mentioned Arabs and Maths, right? Mathematics is an African invention. When my son was at camp here studying, and I looked at his math books and homework, I then went and searched to find a book on the history of mathematics that will address some of these things. Because the way in which people have been taught about math it is as if it is a European in invention. Or a Greek. Or a Greek. Yes. Well, yeah, yes. That's what I mean. The, 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 the ancient Greek. Yes. Right? Like Pythagoras, who studied for 15 years in Egypt. 15 years. Right? What? You will never see that in any of our books in schools. What? So what I'm saying, and, and therefore the, the absence of this, the, the issue of black skin, White heart. Mm -hmm. There were some. There were. There was a couple in Jamaica. I probably was about uh, still a teenager. The Tellwells. I don't know. They were. Te you know the Tellwells. Like they were expelled from school because they want to teach elements of African history. The Tellwells. I was still in Jericho in Hannibal. Right. I was probably 16 or there, and they and they were. Um, Expelled, right? Walter Rodney, UWI graduate, UWI lecturer. If you read what the Home Affairs Minister said at the time about him being made persona non grata, was that he was teaching African history in communities in Jamaica, and that is bad for the tourist industry because if you teach African history, that people are going to get angry. First, 
Who my favorite man is up? What my name is? Ken, my name is? Yeah, not Ken. Yeah. Roy. 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 Are they brothers? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. So, so, um. That's the first plan. So, 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 so the, the, the issue is not English per se. In fact, literature in the Caribbean is one of the areas that we have been most liberated in. In terms of the production of literature. The Caribbean is one of the main space for literature globally. And English literature, the Caribbean is all producing, not just the Caribbean, the black, um, the black diaspora, the, well, the black uh, African Americans look at their publications in relation to, to, to poems and or in films or in um, um, books and so on. Uh, look in India, the, the production of English literature with an East Indian sensibility. Look in Africa, with a shady and persons like that, and down the line until um, this this year. So, so literature is, a, is an area, and the French, the French, um, Asian um, literature people. Uh, and so on. Literature is so. So we should learn a lot from literature. Although there's a problem in Jamaica still that somehow to teach Jamaica and the structure and the grammatical structure of, of Jamaican language, somehow it will make them not learn English. And yeah. therefore, you must kill Jamaica, <laughs> which everybody around the world wants to speak. No, I, I, in fact, I've said you know if. The, the, the Jamaican middle class, if you were to wait on the Jamaican middle class to become the founders of Jamaican music, recorded right. music, right. we would never have that. And, and that's why I, I talk about the full cultural tradition and, 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 the, and, and pedagogy in, the, in, 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 in that tradition. And its importance, one of, one of the, the in term, one of the, one of what I would like to say in terms of have some form of um, what we need to do is to is to learn the methods, the philosophical and aesthetic methods of the folk cultural tradition, and assert it as part of the formal tradition. Right? Part of the formal tradition needs to be the folk cultural tradition. Right? We we need not just learn what Louis said about points and the point you wrote which we must. But you, we need to know the underpinning, the historical linguistic underpinnings of, it, of our poetry. Right? So you make better sense of our work, but at the same time you're connected with ancestry. And we have a problem with ancestry. That whole thing, you must throw it away. I mean, what, <laughs> Marcus Garvey's niece died in the 80s, and the day after she passed, she was about 90. The day after she passed, they, they, they burned all her things. They burned all her things. And we have that type of mentality. The archival is seen as rubbish. As Garvey. <laughs> so you must want to lose. Right? So, 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 um, so, so these are some of the things. How do, how do we teach our, our main part of our curriculum and ends part of teacher training? Very important philosophical, aesthetic, and methodological lessons from the folk cultural tradition, sure. which was what made Jamaica big globally. Yeah. And, and when I'm saying this, I don't, when I say aesthetics and and the, the philosophical I'm talking about in in our proverbs, in our, in our religious texts and uh, and rituals, um, the way in which um, certain certain um, um, uh, certain type of expressions are created in say the revival yard or the kumina yard. Or across the Caribbean, you, you have you, you have similar type of 
of institutions, which by the way played a tremendous role in Africans freeing themselves from slavery. Right? And, and therefore, when we, when we teach history, which is not compulsory for most of the, the classes now, um, so what I'm talking about is not just teaching history. We're teaching people to know themselves. That is what we're teaching. That's the importance of this type of teaching. Right? Teaching you to know yourself, which is the first principle of Godless philosophy. God said the first thing that we have to know is to know ourselves. And the best way to know ourselves is through reading. And the best material to read are historical materials. Uh, but he, he also went further than that. That, it, it, that the most important form of learning, because you, you don't have some of these things in the school, or most of these things in the school, is what he called, what I call self-directed learning. And what God did was to apply the principle of self-reliance to learning, so that you become self-educating as he was. <laughs> right? It's, it's very important. And even, even if you are a university graduate at any level, self-directed learning is still the most important power that you have in the realm of learning. To be able to teach yourself to learn. Right? So people like Arthur Schomburg, J. 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 A. Rogers from Jamaica. Right? Edward Blyden. Uh, these, these are persons who have gone through the process of self-education. Even when they went to formal institution, your education should not end because you are taught this way. Right? That is a very important part of what we need now. Yeah. What we need now. Right? So, I mean, just one thing. You know that the, in, the Industrial Revolution in Britain was predicated on metallurgy by, by Jamaican yes. during slavery from Morant Bay. Yes. Right? Yes. In Jamaica. Yes, yes. In, in, right? in, in Morant Bay. Right? And they took it. Without any patenting, and it became the basis of Britain's industrial revolution. Right? So, so we don't know our history enough, and the more we search, the more we search, our search should then find their, their, their way into our curriculum. The purpose of researching, and researching anything, medicine. My view is we must learn the best of human culture. Period. Human culture, wherever that culture is, and wherever the authorship of that culture is. We must learn the, the broadest sphere of education we have is the better we will be as human beings and in terms of the education that we acquire. But self directed learning is very important. And as you mentioned that, my question which would have strengthened Peter. And and Madam Nancy, um, the narrative, you can speak about the changing of your interiority. And um, in the, the Jamaican state, social state, the narrative that has been constructed directly against that project, meaning that one would imagine that after the kind of negative identity, um, education that you describe again very graphically. The logical thing would be a healing where you learn to adjust to a positive image of self. But in the Jamaican space, the, the narrative that has been constructed against that is once you were black and white, 
and Chinese and all of those things in Jamaica. Now we are one. So let's stop, stop all of this talk about blackness and white. That's going back to the past. And that's going back to something that makes everybody uncomfortable. So, exactly, we are all we are, we are, we are all dark. What you call it? Mongrels, we're all mongrels. We are the Jamaicans, a new identity. So let's forget all about that. We don't need to get back to that. That's that's very burdensome. We are one out of many one. That's the that has been the narrative that has been constructed. Anytime somebody wants to talk about bringing race, race is a social construct, and anytime so, somebody says that, it means that they want to deconstruct it, right? So, what do you have to say about that? Well, I agree with you, and um, by the way, um, the abolition of, of um, emancipation day was justified that it was what you said. The argument for abolition was what you said, right? So, um, so, so it's a fear. It's a fear of a population that is some ninety percent black, right? I don't know in the whole. I don't know in all all of the spaces where where millions of Africans, some eighty million, were held in enslavement. There is none. I know of no incident, incident, any need, any, any movement, any political party, or major leader. Well, that the solution. Um, this lady alluded to it to some extent about the international implications of uh, where we are today because there are influences that are reinforcing to some extent the sort of idea that black people are inferior. Those in influences are continuing despite the fact that, as you spoke about quite eloquently, what we have been able to achieve as a country, particularly in cultural areas, etc. And I also, um, I despair about two things about this. One is that there is an economic impact that I can see um, as far as where our people, how people can contribute to our own development, to the development of the world, if we are being devalued, if we are still being devalued. And secondly, um, the, the lack, there seems to be a gap in our history, because you have written about the Haitian Revolution and the importance of that event for the people of the Caribbean. And yet, um, the, the impact of what is happening in Haiti today is not to be felt by Jamaica, which speaks, as far as I'm concerned, to a failing, a continued failing in our education. Thank you. Yes, amen. I, I agree with that. Um, by the way, uh, when, the, when the people of Haiti made their revolution, Many enslaved Jamaican built rafts and went to Haiti. And they were made within a year citizens of Haiti. But that's not part of our education. That's not part of our education. Haiti was one of the reasons why slavery was, a, was abolished. First, the trade, and then the, the institution itself. Haiti was a major factor in those freedom struggles. In 1865. In fact, there were persons who were arrested in Jamaica for being influenced by, by the Asian Revolution. So, 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 um, so, so, yes. Another point on Haiti, which we don't know much of, is that um, the British invaded Haiti from Jamaica. I think it's 18... 1795 uh, they invaded Haiti from Jamaica. But you know your history, right? And and um, they were defeated under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture. And they took with them I think fourteen thousand black black troops. They call them black shots. The Jamaican colonial government bought them off the slave markets and trained them. 
militarily. And they were part of the contingent in Haiti to reimpose slavery in Haiti. And they were defeated. Right? They let their last stand was in Chapmel. And so the British had to surrender. And when when they were coming back to Jamaica, they wanted to take back those black troops to Jamaica. And Toussaint said, we will not allow you to take those, those men back to Jamaica to re-enslave them. And so that those people, their, their heritage is still in Haiti today. You know? So, so the important thing is, is how do we know our history? And broader than that, how do we know about our cultural tradition and the absolute richness of this cultural tradition and the meanings, the symbolic meanings and the rituals that 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 are done by way of these um, these institutions? How do we increase that in the educational system, but but also in in civic organizations? And, and citizens association and all of that. I hear your funny joke. Students yeah. are drunk and that's right. at Jamaican College. I yeah. literally took them, we had 15 of them and we took them down to Erie Castle to meet with Kuman and drums. And it was fascinating to us, first we had them out of 8 Mile Hill Bay, but it was fascinating to us who are students of the drums here on the island in Jamaica. And I've even come across professional drums. They break well versed in West African rhythms, but they're not Gavush. They don't take the time to go find the elders. They don't take the time to immerse themselves, yet get upset when ethnomusicologists of other hues come into the country, write great dissertations, and have great degrees. Well, so the, so the schools need to have trips. Yeah. We don't do that. I'll tell you, I, I, went, I went to a high school that shall remain nameless to speak and um, and the, the, the principal took me to a big room that they were having an exhibition of revival here right and um, she stood at the door and said you can go look at that and i'm going in there she's yeah. the principal yeah. and it's a person with a master's degree in education yeah. Yeah. right so 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 there's a, that fear, that fear is amongst different segments of the population. There are teachers who teach art, and so they are not making the discussion. And they teach art. <laughs> so, 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 it's, so the problem is widespread. And as, as I say, we say, we, we won't recoil from dealing with the issue, but it, it requires that more people speak out. I just speak in your community organizations. And if you're invited somewhere to speak, you talk about that. Because, I mean, the richness that we have, we really don't understand it. And, 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 and I mean, sometimes people from abroad have understood it better than us. <laughs> right? Um, so you, you talk about, we know about the power of Mali. But do we know about the power of, of um, stitch and um, scratch? You scratch very in, in terms of music production technique, he has influenced the world more than anybody else. The production techniques used to do music in the United States and other places are good. The least much current developing the black art studio and his experimentation. So, so that we need, so so we need to learn in school about these things. That, 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 that's it. And, and, and Peter, look. In fact, yesterday was it? Yesterday I spoke about. Look at the legendary uh, agriculturalist TV lady. What do we know in our school about TV lady? Uh, this man, this man's work is, is in Australia, no eating grass, or uh, whatever they eat, in, 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 in Brazil, in Argentina, in Cuba. Uh, uh, we know, so we talk about in, innovation and all of these things. But the day he died, his work came to an end. Voters, what happened to voters? 
make it with the first one. Was he the first one? I think he made me look. I don't know. He went out. Yes. I'll just take this last question of the conversation starts there, but I'm going to ask one last question based on that. I think he was the first. I think he might have been. This is the professor. When you were speaking about the struggle, um, it resonated with me about being a girl, being educated. Um, and uh, I was educated in Jamaica, and I feel in many respects my education was superior to I lived in the United States. It was. Years. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. Um, through from Miss Butler's to yeah. Uni, yeah. Uh, back in the day. And, um, but I think that women have had to struggle just as, maybe not just as much, but not to be put down particularly in the area of mathematics and science, and also to, to use our educations in, in our lives after we leave school. Um, so, you know, I think that it, it's, it may be different color, but it also works for gender. Yes, it does. Um, I have one yeah. question for you. You mentioned earlier that there are some writings in Aramaic that came over. Aramaic, Aramaic, Aramaic. Arabic. 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 Yes. Arabic. Do you Not know? Rather writing. Oh, so they were literate. They were literate. Were, 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 were there any fragments of such documents? Not that I know. Not that I know. But I know that in the United States they have published a manuscript. And it was recently the person who wrote it was an enslaved man, and he wrote about his life. Right. In Arabic. In Arabic. Right. But uh, this is what you do. I went to Dublin, Dublin, Dublin. I, I went to, I, I went to Moortown. Uh, and in Moortown, there's an Arabic influence, Islamic influence right. in Moortown. Charleston. Charleston too. All right. Yes. Because Sultan Afos went there. Okay. A okay. fraud. A fraud. That's very clear. A fraud. Right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, in, 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 um, in, in, in Morumtun, for example, when I went there, they greet us in Arabic. As-salamu alaykum. As but they don't have anything in there. Right? The older generation of, of Morumtun, they, they were more Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, Professor Hong, any last words that you'd like to leave us with? I have been doing it for a while, but I'm glad that I was able to come here and speak. And um, education is my passion. I have studied extensively the informal sector because I think informal sector has a the formal sector has a lot to learn from the informal sector. And when I speak to some of my students. Every year, what are you done here? Sir, how come you know these things? Mm -hmm. right? And I'm convinced, especially with boys who are belligerent, they need to know this history. They need to know this history. I have to teach in Craig Town for five years. It's not happening anymore, for five years. And I taught them philosophy. Yes. And those students were better than my students as well. I taught them philosophy. And I have a course called the philosophy of success. And the subject matter was to look at people who look like them, who have become global leaders. Right? To essentially say, look, you can if they do it, you can do it as well. Right? Sometimes the type of education or the setting really alienate many young people, mm -hmm. right? We have a better place and a more peaceful place yeah. if they are able to see themselves, their agency working and they're becoming independent thinkers and learners and let them get away in the classroom and do what they do culturally and otherwise. We will be at a much better place. Although we have had very 
important scholars coming out of our school system. Jamaicans who go to America to learn after passing through our schools do better than those people over there. And it's a long while ago. I mean, during the time when Marcus Galvin and, and, and many people from the rest of the Caribbean went to the United States. The most educated people in the United States were Caribbean people. Renaissance. Yep. Yeah. And we're talking about the early 20th century and the late 19th century. Right? So despite the, the problems and there are significant ones with the education system, there's the other side in which, which we can learn from as well. But we need to bring both of them together. The unspoken ones, the unspoken philosophy, uh, the marginalized philosophies, we need to, and pedagogies, we need to take them into the system and learn more. I'm sure everyone agrees that this has been a very enlightening discussion. And certainly one of the key things I take away with me this evening is self-directed education. There's no doubt that the curriculum, especially in the high schools, where all the very young, fertile minds are, needs to be expanded, and I think we need to advocate for that. Because when it comes to our history, it is quite clear that not enough is being imparted to our young people. And uh, we all can make that change, we all can advocate, we all can certainly push forward towards seeing this important change. So I thank you so very much, Professor Hutton. You are definitely, you are definitely a Jamaican star. You are legend. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for being here with us and for partaking of this important discussion. And I just want to bless you all and wish for you all a good rest of the evening. And hopefully, Professor Hutton will be back for part two and before, before one, one moment though, before I go, I should remind you that books written on the life and legacy of national hero Norman Manley, the right excellent Norman Washington Manley, as well as works offered by our own esteemed speaker, Dr. Clinton Martin, are outside for you to purchase. No, no, to look at. Oh, to look at. <laughs> Sorry. But they are, Next they are, time you should yes. bring some to purchase. Yes. There are some to purchase. Yes, yes. yes. so there are, there are books outside. Someone on the book. Yeah. Yes, there are books outside that you can look at. So feel free to stay back and, and have a look. So good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I'm thinking about that, you know, 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 What's I I I that Yeah. 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 Yeah.